ever since that first experience, I felt like there needs to be a change in the health and fitness industry because it's all about macros and calories and weight loss and supplements and how to get the body. And if you get this body, then all your, all your problems will go away and then, and then you'll fit into society and then people will love you and then you'll love yourself. And I, I wish that were true. <laughs> I really do. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Health Theory. I am here with the fit to fat to fit maestro himself, Drew Manning. Drew, welcome to the show. Tom Bilyeu, dude, it's always a pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me back on. Dude, my pleasure. What the hell, though, are you thinking? Why are you doing this again? <laughs> uh, such a good question. So here's the thing, Tom. 2020 has been such a year of radical change, right? Whether people like it or not, things are changing. We are changing as a society, as a culture, uh, as a world. So Fit to Fat to Fit was my original first journey of gaining weight on purpose back in 2011. I put on 75 pounds in six months. Um, and that was the first time I've ever experienced what it's like to be overweight because my whole life I grew up in shape. I played football and I wrestled since I was little. And I, as a personal trainer, I couldn't connect with my clients in, in a sense where I couldn't understand why it was so hard for them just to eat, you know, live a healthy lifestyle. I'm like, you guys, it's so easy for me. Why, why is it so hard for you? So anyways, this idea popped up in my mind. And so I, I, uh, I jumped on it and decided to do it. And I put on 75 pounds of fat in six months. And it was one of the hardest, most humbling experiences I've ever been through. But I learned so many valuable lessons from it because it shifted my perception of how I viewed transformation. And then from there, it totally shifted my branding and how I helped people more so on the mental and emotional side of transformation versus just the physical side. And um, for me, that's where I felt ever since that first experience, I felt like there needs to be a change in the health and fitness industry because it's all about macros and calories and weight loss and supplements and how to get the body. And if you get this body, then all your, all your problems will go away and then, and then you'll fit into society and then people will love you and then you'll love yourself. And I, I wish that were true. <laughs> I really do. Um, but you know, like I was saying, 2020 is a year of radical change. And I feel like I have an opportunity to make it even more impactful, more educational, more inspirational, because now people can follow me as it's happening. Back then, there was no Facebook Live. All right, There was no Insta stories. It was just my Facebook posts from time to time, and that was it. And I feel like if I could do this again in 2020 as a 40-year-old, my message of empathy, which is what my main thing is about, that's what my brand is about, is bringing empathy first to the fitness industry. And then from there, we could talk about diet and exercise and supplements and those kinds of things. But no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care first. And I truly believe that, especially in this industry. And I feel like if we want to help change people in this industry, I feel like it, let's try empathy. Why not? This, this time, we need empathy in this world more than ever. And I feel like in the fitness industry, it's an industry that lacks empathy. People who are larger are judged. They're looked at as lazy or, or, or weak or less than. They don't have the willpower or the discipline. And I feel like that's just not true and it's not fair. And I feel like this is a vehicle to bring my message of empathy. And then also I turned 40 this year. I <laughs> would advise all fit fat to 40. That demographic, we all know, you know, as you get older, people are like, oh, my hormones, my metabolism is changing. Well, let's put that to the test. Let's do this together. I'm going to gain the weight. And then come January 2021, I'm, I'll hold your hand. We'll do this journey together. So that's those are the reasons in a nutshell. <laughs> Man, it's so interesting, this idea. The idea of empathy is, I like that a lot. I want to, though, go back to why there's so much, um, I will say, inherent shame to being out of shape where even if nobody else were heaping it on you, I think people will heap it on themselves. And one of the things I found interesting about the first time you went on this journey was that you were paranoid about the way people were looking at you without even knowing if they were actually looking at you some kind of way. And I'm curious, why do you think people struggle so much when they're out of shape just in and of themselves? I think it's, 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 it's our programming from the social media, the movies we watch, the uh, TV shows, the magazines. And I feel like some people have experience being treated differently in society. I think for men, it's a little bit different. It's okay to be a little bit pudgy and to be a little bit bigger. But for women, especially, I think women have it way harder than men in our society because maybe someone made a comment. Maybe it's from their mom or from their dad or from their siblings about their body. And at some point in time, you know, we bite into that myth that I am only of value if my body looks a certain way. And if I don't, then you know, I don't fit in and people will make fun of me. And I think it starts from a very young age. I have two daughters that are nine and 11 and I'm super careful about how I talk about my body and their body um, in front of them because I think it starts at that age and it's, it stems from, you know, 
whether you like it or not, your parents or even your grandparents of how they viewed their bodies. And I don't think it, it happened until probably, you know, the 20th century when we put more emphasis on fitting in and looking a certain way. And um, I think people buy into that myth at some point in time. And then from there, I think that's where the self, you know, shame and, and even self hate stems from is because they bought into that myth at some point. Now, how do you talk about your body and what you're going through with your kids? I'm super curious. <laughs> yeah, I did a post about this uh, a couple months ago, and it was really popular because, you know, how I talk to my daughters and how their mom talks to them is super important. We never make it about their body image. We never make it about losing weight or having, you know, or being skinny. We always talk about health. And so, you know, when we talk about foods, I don't like to label foods good or bad for them. But what I try and say is like, hey, these foods will probably make us feel better. And eating this junk food is probably going to make us feel worse. And it's really interesting tying this into what I'm doing now. They get to see that firsthand. They get to see their dad struggle eating these foods, which they think is fun. They're like, yeah, yeah, I want that. I'm like, but look what it's doing to me. I'm taking a nap two, three times a day and I'm grumpy and I'm moody. You, you see how this is playing into it. So it's not so much about my belly growing or it's not so much about – you know, them gaining fat or losing fat. It's about what's going to make them a better basketball player. They like basketball. You know, they're into skateboarding now. What's going to make you a better skateboarder? What's going to make you better at Roblox, right? Even like the video games that they, <laughs> that they play, I try and make it about that rather than body image. And this is what I learned from my first journey. My body image back then was my self-image. And if I could help my girls realize that they are more than their bodies, that they are not just their bodies, um, I feel like then growing up, they won't be as, as obsessed or attached to their body image as their self-image. So we talk about you know the other talents that they have, whether it's singing, whether it's dancing, whether it's how smart they are at, at school or their ability to um, you know even play a video game really well. Like I think a couple times too, when they've overcome fears of like, riding a bike, doing the monkey bars, um, you know little things that they didn't think they were good at at first, Letting like reminding them of those moments when they overcame fears and how brave they are. So those kinds of things, you know, throughout their their life, is is constant. I think constant reminders to them of what they can accomplish, not just with their bodies, but also with their amazing minds. Do you worry at all about being so afraid to put any pressure on them that they won't take their bodies seriously? That's a good point. But if, yes and no, because I think you could go to extreme on on both sides of it. Right. And I feel like w the way we approach it is very balanced where, you know, they do know that their bodies are important, which is why we teach them about health and why we teach them about what it's like to feel good. But then also I've given them learning experiences where they felt what it's like to eat a bunch of junk food. And guess what? <laughs> they felt like crap. And that experience helped shape their belief of like, all right, maybe I shouldn't eat 12 Twinkies in one sitting, you know, maybe just one, for, you know, from time to time. And they don't eat Twinkies, but I'm just saying in general. Um, so I think, I, I feel like we do, uh, we have a good balance, but it, dude, being a parent is freaking hard because you think <laughs> you're doing things right. And I don't care how perfect you think you're doing things. I, I think kids are just this amazing learning tool to let you know just how much you need to grow as a human still. <laughs> Talk to me more about that. What do you mean that? Because I'm assuming any sort of disturbance you create in their psyche was not done on purpose. Are you saying that you worry that if you haven't dealt with something and you process sort of out loud or live in a way that they'll then interpret in a way that's ultimately going to lead to a negative outcome? Yeah. And it's based off of my experience of how I view my parents. Because how I assess my parents now that I'm 39 years old, I look back and I'm like, oh, they did this, they did that, that caused me to do this, that it shaped me in a certain way. So I'm like, all right, now I'm the parent. This is what I'm going to do differently thinking, okay, well, I'm not going to do what they did that, that messed me up. Now I'm going to do all the things that I know how to do. But at the end of the day, <laughs> my girls still throw tantrums or they, they fight with me and I fight back with them. And so there's these constant reminders of like, yeah, you think you're doing things right, but who knows? It's it's a it's one of those things where you could check all the boxes and you know show that you're doing things what you think is is right, but kids are very surprising. They're their own person, so no matter how well how formulated how well formulated your approach is, they're gonna surprise you and they're gonna throw you curveballs. And that's the beauty of being a parent, in my opinion, of like okay, well, this is happening. Let's try this and see if this works, you know, or take away their phones or maybe limit their, their phone time or all these different techniques. And, 
each one is, is, is so different from, you know, I have two girls. They're so different from each other. So what works for one doesn't work for the other. <laughs> that That's the crazy part to me, man. It's like you might even nail it with one of the kids, but then yeah. the other one struggles. Or you might nail it with one aspect of their personality over here, and then it doesn't work over here. But then what's working <laughs> over here then isn't working over there. It's, ah. Oh, that, that seems yeah. really, really rough. Now, one thing that I find intriguing about you, so for anybody that doesn't know your story, you come from 11 brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. if I remember right. So yeah, man. obviously big family. I'm guessing one of the ways that you stood out was through your involvement with sports, wrestling, football, I think. Um, yeah. And I'm curious if you think about, because I'm, I'm really focused on this idea of body image and what constructs that. And if you think there are nudges into things like either sports or weightlifting or something, hiking, something that will give them an exciting relationship to their physicality that might then allow them to recontextualize it instead of just an asset of beauty, but something else as well. Yeah. And that's why I'm open to them exploring, you know, um, you know, like I said, right now, their thing is basketball. But for the other one, um, she likes more dancing and, and ice skating. And so we allow them to kind of go through those experiences rather than saying, hey, like, for example, if I had a boy, my mentality before I had kids growing up playing football was like, hey, if I have a boy, he's playing football from this age. I'm going to coach him. He's going to he's going to work out whether he likes it or not. <laughs> you know, that that whole approach with my girls, I've kind of learned there's a good book called Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. I highly recommend it to any girl dads out there. And I think for me and, uh, and those other girl dads, it's important to let your daughters explore what they want to do instead of put pressure on them to fit in. Like, hey, you got to be a cheerleader. Hey, you got to do this. I'll support them whatever they want to do. But I feel like there have been some nudges from me knowing how important health is to try something that's physical, a sport of some type versus just video games and watching Netflix all day. And I feel like as a parent, you got to get creative sometimes and just say, instead of just saying, well, one day she'll pick what she wants to do. Maybe I put her in things purposely and see if she likes it or not. If she hates it, I'll take her out. But if she loves it, maybe that's her thing. And she never would have known that had she, if she didn't have that experience. Yeah, totally. Now, talk to me about um, is there such a thing as like an innate driver in your mind to be in shape or to look a certain way? Or do you think it's all external coming in? Yeah. So I grew up in a family of 11 brothers and sisters. All my brother, older brothers played sports and football and wrestling, right? And so I saw them as a little kid and they had muscles. And I'm like, man, for some reason that was so cool. And growing up in the whole Arnold Schwarzenegger era of like seeing him in movies, I'm like, man, why is like Conan the Barbarian? I'm like, I want to be like that guy. So I think those experiences shaped my beliefs of what I wanted to fit into. So from a very young age, I was working out, wanted to lift weights, wanted to, to build some muscle, and that carried over into, into my sports. And so I think now, being 39 years old, having done one fit-to-fit-to-fit -to -fit -to -fit experiment, and, and luckily having that self-awareness now, knowing that I am more than my body, there is still this part of me that loves to – yeah, I look good, but I love just the feeling of being healthy. And now that I'm doing this second experiment, that's what I miss the most. I would choose feeling healthy any day over having the body. Now that I've experienced this now two times, I, and I think that's what sometimes people miss. They're like, I want the body. I don't care how my health is. <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes to get that body thinking that's going to. But I think as you get older, you get wiser, you realize that your body might not look that way forever. And what what do, what good does it do? One thing that was really interesting to me when I really got lean was, and this goes back to, you know, how much of this is external versus internal. Mm -hmm. No one ever told me what having muscle felt like. So I never thought of it. It wasn't some external pressure that was on me. It wasn't even a concept that I had. Yeah. And then one day I, I, after working out like a demon and getting lean, I reached across myself like this and realized that my pec was hard. And I was like, whoa, that was so fucking cool. I was like, that's so rad. And then you're like, there's something about palpating yourself when you're lean that feels good. Like you get yeah. this burst of like, whoa, that's cool. And palpating yourself when you put on fat that doesn't. And that that isn't me like nobody in my life had ever touched me and said, you feel squishy. Never, ever, yeah. ever. Yeah. But when I would touch myself when I got heavy, I was like, ooh. Like there was something that felt intrinsic about it. Now, the reason I harp on like this is not so that people will develop body dysmorphia and become obsessed with getting lean. Yeah. It's to get to understand why the diet industry is as big as it is, 
why people fret over this as much as they do, why people are so drawn to what you're doing, why empathy is so powerful in all of this. Yeah. Because on the other side is like, I wish that there was nothing pushing you internally to want to look better and feel stronger and for guys anyway, to feel harder. But yeah. It is, and it's there, and if you ignore this, it's the same as ignoring doing hard things. You just won't ever get to the place that you could get to where that sense of emptiness, lack of fulfillment goes away because people think it's gonna be money. They think it's gonna be their body in and of itself. It's not. It's doing hard things to get a result that matters. And by yeah. matters, I mean part of it is that intrinsic push. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things I'm noticing during this journey that kind of is, um that has to do with what you're talking about is is I went from one extreme being super healthy to being super unhealthy to to the other extreme and man I I, I kind of forgot how hard it was <laughs> mentally emotionally physically I'm like damn this is a lot harder than I remember it being um, but it's so interesting because going from that extreme to that extreme of course I'm going to notice all the differences and all the major changes that are happening but let's say someone has been living in the unhealthy world for a long time that becomes their norm that's their day in and day out they're like Drew everything you're talking about like that that's my life but they don't notice that huge shift and change because they've never been on the other side of it. So I'm like, man, if I could give someone the feeling of being healthy or of being lean, like you're talking about, if I could just give that to them for a moment, they might then be like, man, that's what it feels like because they don't know any different. They're like, I feel okay. Like I'm not, I don't feel like I'm dying, but they don't really know what they're missing. And so for me to go from this extreme to that extreme, I'm noticing it every single day. And it's way harder than people think it is to lose your health like that. Um, but this is where transformation gets so more complicated than people think because people are like, yeah, you, you should have this drive. So therefore just do it. But what people don't realize is, is self-sabotage, self-worth, those kinds of things keep people from, from actually doing it because they feel like, you know what? I don't deserve this. I'm a failure. I suck at life. And there's a lot of people that have bought into that myth from a very young age and now they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s and they're like, uh, you know, it's too late for me or this self-sabotage kind of mentality, which carries over into other go, aspects of life. Go a little deeper about self-sabotage for me. How do people yeah. end up there when it comes to body and exercise? So inside of all of us, we have this little, uh, you know, negative self-critic all the time saying, you're not going to be able to do this. That's going to be too hard for you. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. And from a very young age, we've kind of taught ourselves that through experience. Like you tried something and let's say you sucked at it or you gave up after a while because it got hard. And then that builds this, this little negative uh, self-critic inside your head constantly reminding you of those moments those experiences from the past letting you know like yeah it's cute you're trying for this but guess what we know you you know that we know you and you're going to go back to this way and so people in the moment they're like nope this time i'm going to willpower my way through it i got this i can do this you know two weeks in three weeks in, they're like damn this is so hard i want this i, I feel like i want this food their body almost fights back against them and that negative self-critic never goes away it's always constantly there to remind them like you know what? You are going to screw up. And then that moment when life happens, stress gets in the way and they're like, you know, they had a hard day at work or with their spouse or finances hit them really hard or something happened. They're like, you know what? Screw it. Give me the beer. Give me the pizza. Like, and, and then the second that happens, that negative self critics there is like, see, I told you so. And they're like, they're convinced. They're convinced that no matter how hard they try, they can never accomplish what their goal is because of life experience. And so, man, this is where transformation is so much more mental and emotional than just saying, hey, here's your meal plan, here's your workout, here's your supplements. You know, you just do it and then you'll look this way and then you'll be happy. But I think <laughs> this is my hope is that th it's time for change. Like 2020 is a year of change. Let's bring some change to this industry where it's been the same thing over and over and over again to really help people on the mental and emotional side overcome those challenges, overcome that trauma that has kept them from, you know, from really truly living a healthy lifestyle consistently and help them overcome the self-sabotage, the, the emotional eating, the addiction, um, and that self-worth, that sense of self-worth so that they do feel worthy to be healthy. Cause that's what keeps people back is like, yeah, their body wants to do these things. They wants to be healthy, but they just, a lot of people just don't feel like they're worth it or they're worthy to, to, to really live that, that healthy lifestyle that we're talking about. How do people develop self-worth? So it starts with self-awareness, you know, knowing who you are, I think honestly becoming the observer of your thoughts. What happens is, you know, as we grow up, I think we, we become attached to our thoughts. We, bec we become attached to our stories and we become attached to our emotions. And so in those moments, we're just, you know, being pulled in all these different directions based off of how we react to situations. And the biggest 
key to overcoming any kind of addiction or any kind of, you know, you're trying to transform any part of your life, it's taking a step back and becoming the observer of those thoughts. And when you become the observer of those thoughts in those moments, you can kind of see like a movie playing out in front of you, what's happening, what, what, you know, what emotion is triggering you to gravitate towards this food or this drug or this alcohol. And you can then thoughtfully respond in those situations. But the problem is that we don't have that self-awareness yet because we're just like on the go. The second we wake up, we look at our phones, we're being pulled in all these directions. It's all about self-reflection. So meditation, getting out in nature, um, finding ways to really just not judge your thoughts. That's so hard for people because they have these thoughts. Those thoughts become stories. Those stories become their reality. And then they react to those stories throughout their life. And it's just like, man, if we could just learn to observe, you know, just for a second in those moments of stress, in those moments of like reaction where you want to grab the food, if you could just learn to observe and say, okay, here's what's happening I'm getting, I'm getting triggered here. My spouse is doing this. My kids are doing that. Okay. Now there's the food. Normally I would go for it. But now when you're have that self-awareness, now you can thoughtfully respond and be like, okay, do I really want to go down this road? I'm going to eat the food, but this is what's going to happen afterwards. So maybe in that moment we choose the higher road and say, okay, now I'm in more and more in control of my thoughts and reaction. Do you have um, tools and techniques for people developing that self-awareness like journaling or um, what does that look like? So there's a list of a few things. One, some type of meditation practice, whether you are a monk or not, me- some type of meditation practice or um, what do you call it? Think a right? <laughs> like that type of practice where you, you can t- just uh, sit with your thoughts and just let them be. Don't judge them. Don't attach yourselves to them. That's the most important thing. And then two is journaling. Three, I would say, would be a gratitude list to you know rewire your brain to look for things to be grateful for. Um, and then a positive affirmation practice. So saying positive words about yourself to yourself, whatever that looks like. You know, it doesn't have to be Stuart Smalley from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you know, we all know that clip. It doesn't have to be cheesy like that, but it does feel cheesy at first. But it, it's really powerful if you can be consistent with it. And then from there, getting out in nature, um, you know, as much as possible wherever you live. I think is really important for us to kind of just sit back, reflect, you know, if you've ever been like in front of an ocean in Hawaii, you're like, man, this is so beautiful and you just observe, right? And so those kinds of things are the list that I would recommend for anyone wanting to truly transform, but, you know, has struggled with the willpower, right? And so the, I would recommend those things instead of just do this workout and do this exercise and eat this diet. Mm. What do you think the um, need for, or maybe you don't think there's a need, but what, what do you think the role of doing hard things is for self-worth? <clears throat> it, it develops that, that, that belief in oneself first and foremost. So believing that you can do hard things. Like the hard part is people are like, okay, I'm going to go run 100 miles. And <laughs> you've never ran 10 miles or, or uh, a marathon. And then you go and you try and you fail and you're like, man, see, I, didn't, I couldn't do it. What if you just started with one thing like, hey, let's make our bed today every single day this week. That's can be hard for some people. But maybe by doing that, then they're like, OK, I believe that I can make my bed every single day. And then from there, it's like, OK, I'm going to turn the water on cold in the shower for 30 seconds. And that's another small thing. And then they're like, OK, that sucked, but I'm going to keep doing it anyways. <laughs> so you find these things that suck, but they're small things at first. And then from there, you build and you're like, OK, I'm going to eat vegetables every day this week. That might suck. That might be hard for some people. And that builds the confidence instead of, instead of saying, all right, I'm going to get skinny in 30 days. I'm going to do this diet. Why not start small and little baby steps first and foremost so that you start to develop that self-confidence that you can do hard things. And then once you believe that, then you can go outside of your self-limiting beliefs and try maybe 100 miles like, like I did. And I never thought I would be able to run 100 miles. But then it grows from there. And then you realize you can accomplish harder things that are outside of your self-limiting beliefs. And that's where it becomes really powerful. Talk to me about your journey to running 100 miles. Was it your brother that read Can't Hurt Me? <laughs> we both read it at the same time. And he was the one who, after reading it, was like, dude, I want to run 100 miles. And we've done kind of extreme things before as brothers, but nothing like this crazy. So we attempted it last year. I remember I texted you that I was going to run 100 miles or attempt it. And here's the thing. I got 80 miles done. So I didn't accomplish my goal of doing 100 miles in 24 hours. But then I thought, man, I never knew I could do 80 miles in 24 hours holy shit, maybe the, maybe if I train for this, maybe I could really pull this off. And so this year I brought on friends like Iron Cowboy and, and Zach Bitter to help actually help me train for this because I'm not an expert in running. I suck at running. 
I've always hated it ever since I played football. Well, that was a punishment. You, your punishment was to run. <laughs> it wasn't anything fun or happy to do. And so I was like, okay, this year I'm going to train for it. So I took seven months to train properly, uh, adjust my diet and my lifestyle to go on these longer runs. And I was gone for three hours, four hours, some sun- Saturdays and Sundays, wake up at 4 a.m., you know, in, in the middle of the night doing these long runs. And this year, you know, uh, I was really uh, determined to do it, but then COVID happened. And so we kept pushing it back and pushing it back. And I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going to go do it in my own, not backyard, but just like 10 minutes down the road. I found a little path, set it up the course, it was a little five, five mile loop, you know, two and a half miles down and back. I had my, my base camp, had some friends and volunteers help me out. And I'm like, I'm just going to do this by myself. And I just went out there and did it one day in June in the middle of summer here in Utah, which is freaking hot as hell. And it was, I struggled to make it through, um, but I did it. And in that moment, I'm like, damn, I want to, I want to show people that, look, I don't expect you to go out there and run a hundred miles, but what can you do that's outside of your limiting beliefs that you haven't tried yet because you're too scared? And so for me, that was a hundred miles. Dude, that's amazing. (laughs) I actually love it more that you didn't have an official race or anything like that, that you just got sick of putting it off. There's something in that yeah. mindset that I think is extraordinarily powerful. Walk me through. So you do the 80 miles, which is technically a failure. What are you saying yeah. to yourself in that moment? You know, I, there was there was two sides of me because the old Drew was very critical, the self-discipline, like, hey, you failed at this, therefore you are a failure. I know we talked about that in our first interview. And that kind of side of me, I was aware that it's there. But then the other side of me was like, damn, look what you did. You did 80 miles in 24 hours. You should be damn proud of yourself. And so those two things combined, uh, in in a way was like a healthy balance for me to push myself to want to do it again, to say, you know what? I think I can do this again if I actually train properly. And (sighs) I hate running, dude. I don't think I'll ever do it again, (laughs) but it was really cool to say that I did it. You know what I'm saying? For sure. Now put me in your mindset. You're running the hundred miles. Um, seems like it would actually be more difficult doing it on a track that's that short. How, how did you deal with the times where I'm sure you wanted to just stop? Like, Hey, nobody is forcing me to do this. Like, no, one will know <laughs> if I quit, why, how did you keep yourself focused? What were the actual words you were saying in your head? Uh, well, there, there was a couple things. It was the words, but also the people that showed up to support me. There was people that ran certain parts of it with me. And having that companionship throughout, my girlfriend was there, uh, a couple of friends showed up to run a couple laps with me. That was really motivating. The other part, and this kind of carries over into my Fit to Fat to 40 journey, there was this other part in my head that said, look, this is going to suck. It sucks right now. This is, gonna, this is uncomfortable. This feels like hell. But guess what? All this hell, all this pain is temporary. And what happens is people get so trapped in the moment and they think their current situation is their final destination. And I constantly reminded myself that my current situation of how bad this sucks, my feet, my knees, my back, like everything was, so, was, was super painful. I just reminded myself that this is 24 hours of my life. This will be over soon. And this pain, this, all this stuff is temporary. And so that's the mentality I'm carrying over into this, this fat gain phase of four months to remind myself like, look, yes, I don't feel the best. I don't look the best. Um, I, this is way harder than I thought it was going to be. And it's way harder than people think it is. But all this uncomfortableness and this pain, I just have to remind myself, look, this is all going to be temporary and it's all going to be okay in the end. Now, one thing that I'm excited about with the way that you're doing it this time is that you're doing different diets and I'm yes. super curious, <laughs> what have you done keto already? Yes. So do you want to talk about that really quick? Yeah. I want to go into so, all four of the diets that you're going to do or have done. Yeah, so keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, I wanted to show people, educate people on how not to do them. Because let's be honest, when people dive into keto, they they don't do the research. They're like, oh, yeah, butter, bacon, and cheese, cut out the carbs. I got this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so I wanted to show people how not to do them first. Actually show people, hey, you can gain weight you know, on keto, on paleo, on vegan, vegetarian. No matter – you know, if you just jump into it, you just can't expect to lose weight. You have to know what you're doing. So with keto, I did it for a week. And here's the results, which is so interesting. And I'm currently on paleo this week. Um, I lost two and a half pounds, which is insane. I was eating 5,500 calories a day. What? Yeah, 5,500 calories a day. I lost two and a half pounds, but there's a big but there. Gained 1% body fat and my in, my waist went up one and a half inches. 
So this is what I wanted to show people. I was eating dirty keto food, so all the low-quality dairy you can imagine, all the diet sodas, all the low-quality like bacon and salami and, and lunch meat and uh, all the keto cookies and treats and all that stuff that exists out there, eating a lot of that food, and I was in ketosis still. No, and my lies. Blood... Not possible. No way. <laughs> yeah. At 5,500 calories, you actually were posting ketones? So 0.5 was the highest it got up to. So yes, let's put it into uh, you know reference here. 0.5 was the highest, but I, it was usually between you know uh, 0.3 when I woke up, and then by the end of the day, we'd get up to 0.5. But wow. um, but my glucose levels. So I'm tracking my my glucose on my CGM device mm-hmm. right here. This was what the interesting thing was. As much as I love keto, and and I d- definitely don't advise people to do the dirty version of keto my glucose levels, that energy throughout the day was way better. Having that level, that flat level of insulin throughout the day, like I slept better. Um, and like I said, my weight went down, but I'm doing my blood work too and I'll get the results back soon to see how my blood work changed. So that's the keto, that that already happened. I'm currently in the paleo phase where I'm just eating, you know, just a shit ton of paleo foods, you know, paleo cookies and paleo waffles and all that stuff, but still some whole foods to show people like, look, you can eat healthy food and still gain weight. And then I'll do the same thing with vegan and vegetarian. I'll do my blood work before and after to see the changes that happen week to week. And then we'll do a comparison, you know, of my weight, my body fat, um, you know, my measurements, but also my blood work to see week to week, you know, the changes. And then come January, I'll be showing people, look, if you want to do these diets, here's the correct way or healthier way to do them. Uh, And the quality of food is important. That's the other thing I'm trying to educate people on is like, look, you can do dirty keto and lose weight for sure. Easy. If you stay at a caloric deficit. Same thing with veganism. You could eat Oreos all day, and if you're in a certain calorie range, you can lose weight. But is that healthier? Do you feel better? And that's the thing I'm trying to show people is like we, we know people that are super lean, super fit, but they eat a bunch of junk food, and it fits their macros, and so they look good, but are they really you know at the healthiest version of themselves? Define that. What do you – like if you're getting lean, in mm-hmm. what way would one be getting unhealthy? It's a, so that's where blood work comes in. And no one really cares about blood work. They just care about a body fat percentage. So get your blood work done. See see if your thyroid is functioning properly. See if your hormones are at optimal levels. You know, um, I think those kinds of things are really important, but they're just overlooked because you could have awesome blood work but still be you know, not super lean and be like, well, I'm healthy. Like I know a, a friend of mine who most of his blood work is, is good. I, I haven't seen all of it. But he's like 500 pounds and his cholesterol is in normal levels and HDL, LDL, all, all that. His triglycerides are obviously really high. But what I'm saying is like it's not the end all be all. But why don't people go off of their blood work as much as they do off of their, their you know, body fat test? Man, so the notion <laughs> that somebody can be 500 pounds but their blood work be in the right ranges and look, I heard you loud and clear and I'm with you. You didn't see them yeah. all and so there may be problems hiding in yeah. there. But I've actually heard people say that getting obese is a protective mechanism, that you're pulling this stuff out of the bloodstream to keep it from being a problem there, shuttling yeah. it off into the fat cells. Um, now, fat as an organ, which can have all kinds of signaling molecules that create secondary problems like having a very hard time actually losing the fat. Yeah. Um, is an interesting thing. But the notion that somebody can be quote unquote skinny fat, that they can be lean, yeah. but their blood markers are a mess. Man, this stuff is so <laughs> complicated. So complicated. Um, yeah, I'm super curious what's happening to your testosterone levels. Uh, I haven't gotten that checked yet, but if my girlfriend was on, she'd probably tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she'd probably tell you brutally, you know, very, she'd be very brutally honest with you. My libido has changed. I do find myself more emotional, uh, which is a sign that my testosterone is dropping. I remember from my first journey back in 2011, it went down, it got down to the low 200s at my heaviest as a 31 year old. Now I'm 39. I'm so at the end of month two, where I will do my testosterone levels again because it takes time to change. Mm. So at month two and month four, at my halfway point, I will be doing the uh, all the blood work. So stay tuned for that. You're definitely going to want to see what happens blood work wise with <laughs> the continuation of this journey. And then obviously comparing the diets too. I think that will be really interesting, interesting to see, even though that's the dirty version of these diets, 
could maybe some of my blood markers improve or, or get worse? We'll see. So we'll talk about all this stuff. That's what this journey of Fit to Fit 40, there's something for everyone. If you want to geek out on the science, there's something there. If you want to focus more on the mental and emotional and spiritual side of transformation, there's going to be something there as well. That's why I want people to hopefully follow along this journey. Even though I'm gaining weight and that part's entertaining, it's like a train wreck you, you, you can't not watch. But the journey back to Fit, 2021, I know people are going to want to make a change because 2020 sucked for so many people and it's was really hard for a lot of people, but that's the thing. Is like, hey, let's do this together. Let's. Why not? Like, I'm, I'll hold your hand. We'll do this together. Come 2021, and that's the part that I'm excited for because I, I want to give people those tools on the mental and emotional side so that they understand this is a complete transformation and their perception shifts, and that's where they make some real lasting change in their life. Are you 100% confident that you will go back to your lifestyle that you've been at all these years previously? 100%. That's my default mode. And that's a, like being a dad. My why every day isn't to be the fit to, to fit guy and make money. My why is to be the best dad I can be. And I know for me, being the best dad I can be requires my physical, mental, and emotional, and spiritual health to be as, as, as best as it can because then I, I show up differently for them. I show up differently for my girlfriend. That's one of the biggest, hardest things about this journey is my ability to handle stress is so diminished because I don't have the motivation because I feel so lethargic. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. Okay, you need this, you need that. Here, just let's just get rid of the stress the quickest way possible because I don't want to have to deal with it. I've noticed those little things start to change where I'm sleep deprived. My sleep has sucked because I've tried, been tracking on my whoop. My sleep is in the yellow or red almost every single night and that carries over into other areas of your life and the ability to handle stress is is way harder. And that's what I want to bring, bring awareness to is like you're not the same version of yourself when you're unhealthy. It's not just about getting fats. It's not just about that. If that's all it was, that would be cool. But there's way more other, there's way uh, more things that happen on the mental and emotional level that you have no idea. But if you could see, you know, the other areas that it's affecting, I feel like then people would hopefully make a change for the better. Yeah, no question. Um, so as you're going through the process then um, and you think about getting back into shape, I know you're trying to develop this empathy. Where is it that people fall off? So if you know that you're going to be back on it, what what is it that you have as, as a mental tool that you think people lack? Yeah, and it's going to be hard in the beginning. And this is what I remember from my first journey. Those first two weeks were hell for me, even for me, someone that loves being in shape, someone that loves being fit. I struggled because my body fought back against me. And so you have to realize that just because you make good choices doesn't mean your body's going to follow suit and be like, yeah, we want broccoli and, and kale. Your body's going to want the high that it got from these foods that you have been feeding it for the past four months, four years, or even four decades. So that's the part where people are going to need the most help. So there's, here, here's what helps people in those situations. One is community, a support system, people that give them a balance of a kick in the butt every once in a while because we all need that, but also empathy and letting them know that they're worth it. So that's what the whole power of this Fit to Fat to 40 journey is, is, is we are doing this journey together as a team, as a community. And so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is all those mental and emotional tools and, and tricks that I, I mentioned earlier, meditation, positive affirmations, uh, a gratitude list. Um, you know, getting out in nature, going for a walk every day, uh, those kinds of things as a daily practice on top of eating healthy and exercising, I think will help people build that self-awareness so that they become the observer of their thoughts. And so that's what I'm really going to be feeding them is the meal plans and the workouts, you know, those are a dime a dozen. You can find those anywhere. But the biggest thing is the help on the mental and emotional side that we're all going to be doing every single day is a checklist. And I feel like that's where people will hopefully as a team, as a community, will come together and shift their perception of what success looks like in health and fitness. Cause it's, it's not about getting the body. It's about falling in love with the process. Cause you're worth it. Not because you hate yourself and you want to look skinny, but because you're worth it to live a healthy lifestyle. And that's the, the, the switch in their head that needs to shift. And that's where these things can help out. I know at one point you were recommending to people to join like support groups and stuff so they could be around other people that were going through the same thing. Do you still do that? Do you recommend therapy? Like how big of a journey is it for people to get their head right? Oh man, it's, it's the biggest part, but there's so many tools. It doesn't just have to be, you know, a, a, a group, uh, you know, on Facebook, it could be religion, it could be church, it could be plant medicine, it could be uh, breath work, it could be, you know, their local CrossFit gym, whatever it is, whatever it takes for that person, find whatever works for you best that helps you feel like you're not alone in this journey. Um, and I am open to different things for different people. Um, but that's the biggest part, I think the biggest component, cause we, as humans, we need that human connection. And there's something about suffering with other people that 
it, it's way more motivating than just suffering by yourself. It sucks way more, you know. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the whole point of the second half of the journey. We'll be doing it together in our you know Facebook group and online at my website. Um, so there will be this community aspect to it. And your primary attack vector for the back half is going to be ketogenics. Uh, it'll be a mixture of ketogenic. It'll probably be more of a Mediterranean style keto, which I feel like f- for me and for a lot of people seems to work better versus butter, bacon, Define and cheese. Find that for me. So it's going to be more polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. Uh, so less red meat, you know, less bacon, uh, less dairy. Cause that's like, like I'm doing now with, with the dirty version of keto. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, that works. You can lose weight on it and maybe it's more enjoyable for you. But when it comes, I think to most people's health, People tend to improve their health better on a Mediterranean-style keto where it's not just saturated fat all day long. But I think for me, I feel a ton better on higher-quality you know, Mediterranean-style fats in so my diet. So what's actually on your plate? So we're talking things like olive oil um, and olives. Uh, avocados are, are big parts of that. Uh, more fish, uh, uh, more lean meats, in my opinion. It doesn't have to be the fattier cuts of steak all the time. I think for me – you know, a lot of people gravitate towards that, but it's going to be more of a, the leaner meats with things like um, olive oil or avocado oil. That and do you just keep be... the lean meats relatively low? Like when you say that you're doing a ketogenic diet, are you actually in ketosis? Yes, I will be in ketosis. My calories will be a lot less <laughs> than what it was for this experiment. <laughs> but the cool thing with lean meats is you can't always control the fat amount that comes in meat. So, you know, if you get uh, one ribeye compared to another ribeye, the fat content can be totally different. And the calorie count could be totally different. So if you get the lean meats and then add in your fats, then you're kind of in control of how much fat you're actually getting. And that's kind of my approach, my philosophy when it comes to keto now versus back in the day. It was like, all right, all the fat, all the fat, all the time, you know, (laughs) the fattier, the better. I feel like, yes, that can work. But I think if you're trying to dial it in a little bit, you know, getting the the lean proteins uh, most of the time, not all the time. But then adding in your fats, you can control how much fat is actually in that amount of food. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. And are yep. you, is it a primarily plant-based diet when you're doing that? I wouldn't say primarily plant-based, but I, I'm i a big fan of vegetables. I do a carnivore thing every now and then, and I actually feel great on a, a, a short-term carnivore. But the thing that keeps me away from doing carnivore is I just love, <laughs> I love avocados. I love, you know, some, uh, some broccoli, uh, cooked in, in butter and, and salt. Like I actually enjoy it. I do. So for me, uh, it's, it's more of a plant-based approach. Like, um, Dr. Will Cole has a book called Ketotarian and it's, it's more of a plant-based approach to keto, but trust me, I'd love my protein. <laughs> so I love my animal protein. <laughs> One thing I'm going to be really curious to see. So I, so I used to wear a, a constant, uh, continuous glucose monitor, I probably wore it for about six months. It was so interesting. I really, really enjoyed it. But one thing that shocked me to my core was that I had, uh, an impossible burger and <sighs> it spiked me almost as hard as cold stone ice cream. I, really? I was like, I'm sorry. What? It was wow. <laughs> the craziest thing in the world. So it, it'll be interesting to see how easy it is for you to spike your blood sugar, even going vegan. Like you said, you can have Oreos on a yeah. vegan diet. <laughs> um, and then obviously then showing people how you can do it well at the end. That'll be super, super intriguing. Are you going to be publishing all of your blood results as you go? Yeah, it'll be on my website as I go, kind of showing comparisons throughout. So you can kind of see side by side what's happening to my blood work. I think the glucose, the ketones the sleep data will all be on, on one site or, or a one page of the website. So that's not up there yet, but it will all be available because the, the end goal with all this is to have everything available to everyone, you know, so they could see everything that's happening to my body, my mind, how it's affecting all of that. So all that information will be on my website eventually in a format that is easy to, you know, easy on the eyes. Dude, where, where can people <laughs> go to follow you on this crazy journey? Yeah, so either fit to fat to 40com either four zero or spill it out. Um, that's my website. You could follow, you know, uh, the the updates throughout. And then my uh, social media is all fit number two fat number two fit, and that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all that stuff. So, yeah, make sure to follow along and pray for me because <laughs> this, is, this is hard, man. It is <laughs> amazing. Well, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope that everybody follows this journey. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe here. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. 
Thank you guys so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.